θα ξέρετε βεβαίω ότι ο Καζαντζάκη 70 χρόνων έγραψε την αναφορά του στον Γκρέκο. Εγώ, 83 χρόνων, έγραψα τώρα την αναφορά μου στον Νίκο. Dear Nikos, I've been close to you uh, rather steadily since 1955, uh, over 50 years, and it's time to come to a reckoning. I'm often embarrassed when asked about my life. Uh, when I reveal I've had only one wife, no mistresses, have held only one job, and have spent my professional career essentially, not entirely, with you, with a single author. It sounds so dull, so stodgy. Didn't I get bored with you? Didn't I get tired investigating and translating you for half a century? Didn't I <coughs> long to venture elsewhere. And I did to some degree. Cavafi, Ritsos, etc. James Joyce, my favorite. And, um, but you were always present as a constant that the others interrupted. And the most curious thing perhaps is that I really never did get bored. I told everybody after doing the letters uh, and I don't think it's happening. <laughs> it's your fault. <laughs> well, why? Why has this been okay? There, I think there are three reasons. First, I felt compatibility between your vision of life and my own. Secondly, I found your language and your thought difficult and was therefore intellectually stretched by both. Third, I was forced by you to explore a huge range of literary, historical, religious, linguistic, and political movements and personalities from ancient Greek times to the mid 20th century. So I'm gonna talk about those three. Interest in your religious element came first and also last. Uh, when I asked when, when people ask me how I first encountered your work, I reply with a rather curious story, and it involves religion. I was a, a graduate student uh, then in Columbia University working toward my PhD in English and Comparative Literature, which meant, you know, when you study something, you don't read, does Shakespeare, study English literature, don't read does Shakespeare and, and Milton and Chaucer, but you read all the second-rate people and the third-rate people. You have to know really what was going on. Uh, and I was at the stage of reading a lot of second-rate British novels. One day, along came a friend of mine, fellow student. He happened to be a devout Roman Catholic from an Irish family, the kind that uh, one sister was a nun and the brother, uh, brother was a priest. He was holding a book in his hand and, he, and I was married already to a Greek, he knew that, we were friends. And he said, I want to give you this book. It's by some Greek, Nikos Kaz, Kaz, Kazatsios, something like that. Please take it. I don't want it in my house. <laughs> because its treatment of Christianity, and especially of the Blessed Virgin Mary, disgusted me so much that I vomited. <laughs> this is real. Vomited. The book was, of course, O Christos Xanastavronete, in the English translation, which is called in America, The Greek Passion. I figured that an author who makes his reader vomit must have some remarkable powers of <laughs> effusion. So I read the book and I found that it was so infinitely superior to the British novels, the British junk I was reading uh, for my degree. 
that I became interested. That's the first I ever heard of Kazantzakis. That summer, uh, with my wife, we went to uh, Thessaloniki, and I went to a bookstore, and I uh, said, uh, uh, I've heard of this author, Kazantzakis. Um, has he written anything that's not already translated? And I was shown a whole shelf full of untranslated books. Because of the religious theme, I purchased Otelefteos Pirasmos and tried my best to read it with uh, my limited Greek. But of course, I was living with my Greek family, none of whom spoke a word of English, which helped me very, very much, as you can imagine. Living in Thessaloniki um, with my wife and family, as I said, I was learning Greek in the best possible way, not in school, but in bed. I was helped by the school books my father-in-law brought me. Uh, he was a, a headmaster of a demotic school in Thessaloniki. So I started with the Alpha Vitario, and I went to the, uh, the sixth, sixth grade. I was able to say things like, Inina echi and a topi. Pais di yaya, kepesi metigiratis. But I was also struggling, dear Nikos, with your marvelous Greek in The Last Temptation. And it was very difficult. Language such as, I'm just picked at random, Marki Pumilusan, Itris Yeneges, Kekondeve Oponos, Natis Smixi, Fones Xehithikan, Apo Tambelia, Erkonde, Erkonde, Natus, Keos na Katar Kilisi, Oyero Zevedeos, Apo Topataritu, Xagriameni, Andra Clarades, Provalan di Xoporta. Oh my, that was very difficult uh, for a beginner, but challenging, energizing. I think it was certainly language that energized you, Nikos. It clearly did me, and indeed my interest moved from religion to Greek linguistics. I found, for example, that in 1906, you stated the following in a letter, and, which of course I'm translating, uh, quote, do not forget that the languages receiving support are chiefly three. One, puristic, two, demotic, three, psicharistic, the language of psicharis, all right? One and three are equally horrible. I support two, demotic, and adore it. Let's remember that most people nowadays are aware of your work only toward the end of your career, the novels, in the 1950s and beyond. But in 1906, when you were in your early 20s, you were a prodigy, a linguistic prodigy, if nothing else. The letters you wrote even in 1902, when you were 19 years old, and had just left Crete for the first time to attend uh, the University of Athens Law School. Those letters are so revealing, and I love them. I especially like one that was sent to a high school friend still in Crete. Again, I'm, I'm translating, of course. Quote, I just returned from the university. One of my strongest moments is when I sit at one of the desks in law school with my eyes pinned on the professor and my mind fluttering through a thousand and one things, except for the lesson. I try to drive poets away from my desk, poetry away from my heart. Yet open in front of me now that I'm writing you are Dante, Manzoni, while my desk is adorned with Hugo and Solomos. Poetry bewitches me. It's like a, a, a marvelously beautiful enchantress and mistress in whose breast one forgets every pain and in whose glance one feels the shudder of voluptuousness. 
Part of the reason that Greek poetry delighted you so much was that by 1906, it was already in demotic. You were a fanatical, uncompromising demoticist then and for the rest of your life. A demoticist, to be sure, not a psicharist. You realized, of course, that the language question, to Groskosithima, was, in your words, again I'm quoting now, not just linguistic but also social and aspiring to become political. Few people now remember that in 1909, you headed in Crete the so-called Solomos Demotesis Society, whose purpose, as you expressed it in a letter, was to conduct, quote, a sacred struggle with the struggle capitalized agora, uh, to emancipate Greeks from their slavery to pedants, even though all the ignoramuses and non-entities have lashed out against us. Your plan was to see what we need to do in order for the language question to enter the Cretan parliament, so that, I'm quoting still, so that our educational re renaissance will start first in Crete, since the homeland of Hortatsis and Koronaros, it certainly must possess the claim and the obligation to be the first to open the great road of deliverance. So, Nikos, you enlisted the help of Palamas, and you published a manifesto for the society in the Demodesis periodical, Onumas, in which you delineated the adverse effects of Katharevusa on education, society, and the nation, concluding, quote, Katharevusa is unable to mold the child's spirit, it suffocates the mind, and distorts the child's natural development. It makes us into superficial people full of hollow words and braggart phraseology. It prevents us from loving books, study, everything serious and researched. It breaks the nation's linguistic unity and little by little our very national integrity. Those are very strong words. But you were fired up. Indeed, you were a sort of demodicist fanatic. Thus, you wrote your first play, Ximeroni, in the demotic idiom that, along with its shocking theme taken from Ibsen about the freedom of women to have a lover instead of a husband, their husband, uh, all this prevented the play from receiving the hoped-for dramatic prize. As the editor of Numas, liberal periodical, of course, wrote apropos, to win a dramatic, uh, dramatic prize, one was supposed to compose iambic 12-syllable verse in Katharevusa and include a pseudo-Aristotelian catharsis. But your play had nothing of that, and it had been at least praised by the judges, uh, although they couldn't give the prize. And this praise helped break the hold of the past on Greek dramatic literature and to advance the struggle for demotic, even though uh, the prize was withheld. I said, Nikos, that you were an uncompromising demoticist all your life. And I really do believe that this was one element, along with one other, your Bergsonism, that remained steady throughout a career in which many other aspects did not remain steady. You were a disciple of Dante's and indeed translated the entire Divine Comedy into demonic Greek that was attacked as being supposedly too radical uh, because it contained, according to the critics, unknown words, perhaps even Cretan dialect, perhaps arbor words arbitrarily coined by yourself. You responded in 1937 saying, quote, our demotic tongue is in a period analogous to that of the Italian demotic of Dante's time. What Dante did, we ought to do also. Dante said, he's quoting now Dante, 
16 great linguistic idioms exist in Italy. The poet must collect words from all these regional dialects and use them in this way, composing the living pan-Italic written language. In, in translating Dante, you continued, Nikos, referring now to your own campaign, I attempted the same task. In the Divine Comedy, all the words which seemed rare and unknown became commonplace. I hope that the same will one day happen in our demonic, and that all the words in my translation that now provoke astonishment will become pan-Hellenic. Alas, poor Nikos, your wish has not been fulfilled. The proof comes in your elephantine epic, The Odyssey, as you've heard from Mathiodakis already, published in 1938 when you were 55 years old. Uh, Mathiodakis, who examined your epic precisely for words that uh, provoke astonishment, found over 5,000, you, you heard of all about that, 5,000 that are not recorded in, uh, in any modern Greek dictionary. Only an uncompromising demodicist, fanatic, or maniac could have expended the energy you did, Nikos, to discover, maybe invent, these words that you hope would become pan-Hellenic. But I know, because your friend Prevalakis told me, that as early as 1927, you were systematically collecting nautical terms, for example, for your epic, and that as you completed various drafts, you went through your word lists systematically to make sure that every item had, be utilize, had been utilized in the poem, and therefore, you hoped, preserved. Some of the words are great fun. For example, colo triviviso. He's laughing, which means to wiggle the backside. A word that surely Alexis Zobas would appreciate. Some of the words are readily comprehensible, such as vorastri, the North Star. I wish I could comfort you by saying that you were successful as Dante in enriching your language. You were not. A few years after your Odyssey was published, you were still fighting the same battle. This time, so the, it's three times in the translation of the Divine Comedy in the Odyssey, and now a third time with the translation of Homer's Iliad with uh, Yanis Kakrivis. Your letters to Kakrivis are all too clear. On February 15th, 1943, for example, you worried about what to do with Homer's proper names. I'll quote a little. The full version of all the names is impossible, this is Kazanzakis, to, uh, to be retained. Idiomeneas, despite the fact that he's Cretan, needs to be decapitated in order for him to become Domeneus. This doesn't bother me at all. The opposite in such a demonic text would make a bad impression on me as though I were, I were seeing poor Eva Sikelianu frequenting our villages. I happen to know, I happen to know, dear Nikos, that poor Eva, who was American, by the way, campaigned for the retention of authentic ancient Greek costumes in contemporary demonic productions of the ancient plays, so you're right to feel that she would have advocated authentic ancient Greek names in your demonic Iliad. In the same letter, you spar with uh, Kakridis, who is much more conservative. For example, you assure Kakridis that the word litho, lithopeti, the throwing of stone, it's easy, isn't it? Yeah, lithopeti. Um, you assure him that it's not Cretan, but pure demonic. It's also used by Kakavitsas, you say. At the end of the letter, in a PS, to a poly to Kakridis, you write, it seems that I'll be doing a supplement to the, to the Academy of Athens Dictionary. It lacks andrala, andiknimi, 
Aquilo Camara, Anna Zevlizo, Akontonisi, Avlonia, which happens to be a female octopus, and Emar Pastos, an Emar Pastos, which I found in a folk song, he says. Apale. Sorry to report, Nikos, that when I looked up these eight words in the new 811 page, volume one of the Goga Kass Dictionary, volume one is only alpha, uh, and it's meant to include everything, I found of the eight, only four. So you, you've had 50% success, not, not good. And I'm told, I hear various stories, that the Kakrilis Kazantzakis translations of Homer are not used in many schools because the language is too difficult. For me, however, your language has always been a pleasure, even when a challenge. Translating the prose of your novels, I felt that I was translating poetry, and I therefore struggled to create something resembling poetry in English. My favorite story about my own adventures with words, your words, concerns the imperative orza, which you use not too often, but in a mantinada, which you cite in Anaphorasno Greco. And it goes like this. Orza, diale timpisti tu che opu navrali vrasi, ya puna sasi mia dulia, ya puna sohalasi. So when I was translating the book, in the late 1950s, I could not find Otza in any dictionary. The dictionaries were terrible. We've, we now have very good dictionaries. But then they were, they were mostly all in Kafarevosa. I think they believe that um, since people spoke Demotic, they didn't need dictionaries. Uh, they only need dictionaries for Kafarevosa, which they had to learn. I asked everyone, what does Otza mean? And I always got the same answer. I don't know, it has something to do with the sea. But what? Finally, one day, it was summer, and we were in Halkidiki on the beach, stretched out on the sand, and there was a fierce storm, you know, a border, very fast. And there were some tourists who had rented a sailboat uh, out not too far away, and they didn't have a slightest idea how to sail, and they looked in real trouble. They were gonna capsize and drown. Whereupon one of the local inhabitants, um, he, he was a fisherman when he wasn't in the summer a waiter in the cafe, he rolled up his trousers, he rushed as far as he could into the water, he cupped his hands over his mouth like that, and he shouted, Otza, Otza. <laughs> I jumped up ran out to him and screamed, then pirazi na vuliaksun, tisimeni otza. And he told me, turn into the wind. So then the question is, how, how do you say that in English? I bet you don't know. It took a little research, but I had friends who were yachts, yachtsmen, you know, and uh, the English word is luff, L-U-F-F. -F. And probably have, most people in English don't understand that, but anyway, that's the word. So I rendered the uh, mantinada, luff the helm, embrace your faith, come what come may, who cares if a project thrive or if it decay? Of course, I found out later that one does not luff the helm, but the bow, but... Uh, it was too late, but the mistake had already been published. <clears throat> I said at the start that concentrating on you forced me to explore a huge number uh, of literary, historical, religious, linguistic, and political movements and personalities from ancient Greek times to the mid-century. And I um, also that I both started and ended with uh, your interest and my interest in religion. So I want to move on to that. How could I possibly become bored with you when, in order to try somehow to catch up with your astonishing rush uh, from interest to interest, I met so many attractive 
people, places, and ideas. And I'll name just a few of them. For example, in the, in the realm of demoticism, one had to get to know Koraïs, Psychalis, Hatzilakis, Sutsos, Solomos, Triantafilis, uh, uh, Triantafilis, Palis, Velmuzos, Glinos, Vlastos, Dragumis, Macrianis, Ptohoprodromos, Roidis. For your political involvements and interests, the Asia Minor disaster, oh boy. Venizelos' various successes and failures, because the Zakis were very related to Venizelos, um, Zachariadis and Vafiadis, the fall of Constantinople, Mussolini, whom he interviewed, Lenin, Stalin, Trotsky, Victor Serge, whites versus reds in the Soviet Civil War, the atom bomb, which you feared would be used a third time, the Trojan War with all the Homeric personalities, Kapovistrias and his assassin, Julian the Apostate, Prince George and everyone else associated with the struggle for Cretan independence, including, of course, the very real and redoubtable Capitan Coracas, a model for your fictional, maybe, maybe not, Capitan Michalis. For your philosophical and religious studies, Henri Bergson, first and foremost, you never departed from his teachings about vital evolution. I especially value the letter you wrote from Paris in January 1908, when you were 25 years old, and you'd gone for graduate studies. Quote, I am pursuing philosophy and literature at the Sorbonne, the Collège de France, and the École des Hautes Études. I wish to formulate my own personal conception of life, a theory of the cosmos and of humanity's raison d'etre, and in accord with that, systematically and with a fixed purpose and program, to write whatever I write. Fortunately, I am auditing the lectures of Henri Bergson, the famous psychologist, and I feel that I am not wasting my time. No, Nikos, you are not wasting your time. Of course, Nietzsche, the subject of your doctoral dissertation, was another favorite of yours, but not a continuing consuming influence to the degree that Bergson was. I must add Plato and Aristotle, whom you love to quote, uh, very often incorrectly, uh, Buddha, uh, various Sufi mystics, Rabbi Nachman of Breslov, and of course your true obsession, your true obsession, Jesus Christ. That's a good place to end the list, because this obsession of yours leads clearly back to my own religious interest. I emphasize the linguistic element up to now because it was omnipresent throughout your career. But the religious element was also omnipresent for you and indeed perhaps another mania. Uh, and it has been pervasive throughout my own long apprenticeship to you, starting with my university friend's vomit continuing with my own interest in Bergsonian vitalism, my translating of The Last Temptation and then of St. Francis, and then my belated discovery of your pioneering role as an advocate of process theology. For this, I thank my friend and colleague Darren Middleton. The, the book, one of his books is back there, a British theologian whose PhD dissertation was on Kazantzakis and the process philosophy of Alfred North Whitehead. I sat on Middleton's dissertation committee and then collaborated with him uh, on a book, I think it's the one that's back there, called God's Struggle, a Religion in the Writings of Nikos Kazantzakis, published in 1996. You, dear Nikos, never read Whitehead, so far as I know, nor did you ever use the term process theology. Thus, I, I'll try to define it. Based largely on Whitehead and, and the American 
Charles Hartshorn, not to mention Bergson, and of course, in back of all of them, Darwin is the, the crucial element. It holds a temporal process which governs our life on earth also governs divinity. Thus, God can no longer be considered as in Plato, Aristotle, etc., and traditional uh, Christian theology, can no longer be considered unchanging, unaffected by the world. Instead, God in process theology is considered, considered relational, in other words, related to, affected by the world. The universe as a whole is considered interrelational, dynamic, a giant ecosystem, always in development. No, you never spoke, Nikos, of process theology by name or used this sort of language, but nevertheless, you were a process pioneer. Let, re let me remind you, Nikos, of some of your own language as found in the letters. And all this is quoted. Fine art is beautiful, and so are music, poetry, Dante, Homer, but now all these seem to me like empty cast off snake skins. I say to myself, I will complete a commentary on our religion. My God is not pure, not spotless, not just, not omnipotent, omniscient, omnibenevolent. He is not light. Struggling, he transubstantiates the night in his heart of hearts and turns it into light. He does not save us, we save him. What does we save him mean? We save the eternal breath inside the ephemeral clay of our existence. We fabricate spirit from the matter within this workshop of our body, liberating God. When you wish to, he's writing to somebody in America who is actually a, a priest, when you wish to apprehend the features of our God, Avoid whatever you have learned from the Christian God. Our God is not all good, all powerful, all wise, all beautiful. If he were, how could he feel pain? How could he struggle? How ascend? I have passed through three great theological stages. One, O oh God, you shall save me. Two, O oh God, I shall save you. Three, O oh God, working together, we shall be saved together. So this last theological stage, humanity working together with a relational God of process theology explains why you could have written so assuredly to Galatia the following pronouncement that might appear to the uninformed as self-congratulatory, if not a bit insane. Quote, I give my entire life exclusively to something above my individuality. I believe in the power of a spirit, capital S, or P in Greek, pneuma, power of a spirit that suffuses plants, animals, people, and that is now desiring to surpass me, to liberate itself from my unworthy nature, to escape me. I am battling to serve this spirit because I know that it, and not this sack, I carry a bone, meat, brain, and passion is my soul's essence. Well, Nikos, you understood clearly the beauty of process philosophy, that it enables each of us to see ourselves as part of a vast, universal, interrelational ecosystem. You understood it as early as the 1920s, whereas Hartshorn's classic statements about process religion do not come until the 1960s and 1970s. What does it all add up to? In many ways, not much. Your program to enrich the modern Greek vocabulary leaves 5,000 of your cherished words unrecorded in dictionaries. 
not to mention Greece's total rejection of your attempted spelling reform and reform of accentual practice. Your favorite guru, Henri Bergson, is poo-pooed by contemporary philosophy, not owing to his doctrine of eternal process, but owing to his belief that this process leads in a predetermined direction to a predetermined end. Process theology is anathema to Greek orthodoxy and Roman Catholicism. Yes, it's routinely taught in Protestant seminaries, but is marginalized even there and left to a few Quaker crackpots like myself and to ultra-liberal theologians like the marvelous Don Cupid, the British theologian, who advises, quote, we must now leave behind us a world in which the mind found rest in contemplating eternal reality, and we must embrace instead a world of endless exchange and change. We need to learn to love transience because it's all there is, and we are part of it. More and more people seem to be reading your religious treatise, Askitiki, but I wonder how many understand it, especially the strange silence at the end. There are some su successful movies of your works, yet Zorba the Greek, uh, which we've talked a lot about and we'll see later, was directed by a man who told me in person that the novel projects how very much you hated the Greeks. And if you ever give me a chance, I'll tell you about my interview with Kakoyanis and how he misunderstood the book. In sum, your extraordinary, varied, and energetic career has led all too often nowhere or to misunderstanding. And yet, and yet, and yet, you are rarely, rarely boring, rarely tedious. You project an invigorating energy even in despair. You sum this up, I think, in two stanzas from your first Terzina. And I'm going to try to end with those. Not many people read his Terzinas. They're difficult poetry, and they're written in the, Dan, uh, the stanza of Dante, Terzerima. Ach, na tan themo, ego pilo, na paro, flor de que nuca aera, na se plato. Plazo. Thus un agnos calos que i cruz mataro tha glicene cavia, que to agro daso tha rodize tis adikias miamera. Matora themu pia pu na proftaso. Here's an attempted translation uh, in which I keep the rhyme and the terzerima. O oh God, my God. Could I but swarthy clay enfold to make you mind and air and flame, chaste and good you'd stand. All anger would away with sweetened heart. Of wrong the fathers tamed one day, a rosy face would show. But now, oh God, my God, it's late to voice your name. In some, the really important impressive thing about your career, dear Nikos, was that despite all your disappointments, all the neglect, all the misunderstanding, all the nastiness that kept you from winning the Nobel Prize, for example, you never lost your amazing energy and always maintained what I like to call an eschatological hope, one always at the end, the eschato, always beyond. Hope that, that not only for yourself, but for all of us. You said it yourself in 1954 as follows, quote, my particular path has been to formulate and save my soul by means of words, by writing. I have done this throughout my life and I'm doing it now by working day and night without becoming discouraged. 
and with the unshakable faith that in this way I am collaborating with God. Thus, of all the virtues that one might ascribe to you, one could say fierce intelligence, openness to innovation, a balance of repugnance and forbearance concerning human failings, the one virtue I consider prime is, in Greek, andohi, endurance, perseverance. Thank you for that, dear Nikos, and for passing a modicum of it on to some of us lesser mortals. Thank you. Thank you.